Hey, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Right Off the Bat podcast. I'm your host, Callan Thomas. Flying solo today without without Darbs. Um, Darbs is probably out on the golf course, which is which is good for him. Um, and he's not as well versed today in our topic. We are doing our first ever right off the bat fantasy football extravaganza. Uh, all you football fans out there know it is week 14 of the NFL season. Um, so playoffs are starting in most formats. And fantasy football is a huge part of Major League Baseball clubhouses. Um, a lot of camaraderie there. And uh, we have a great guest today, the Cleveland Indians catcher, Austin Hedges. Hedgy, how you doing today? Doing good, man. Doing good. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, this is going to be great. Uh, Austin and I have compared notes on fantasy football over some some beers and cocktails in the past, and it's always a, a really good conversation. He's had a lot of success, and um, it's just going to be fun to kind of talk about how fantasy football and, uh, and baseball and clubhouses interweave. But before that, Austin, we are a baseball podcast, so I uh, wanted to talk a little shot before we get into uh, the fantasy football. Um, we'll talk real baseball before we talk fake football. Um, how are you doing this off season? How's, how's everything going for you right now? You know, it's actually, it, it's been a good off season for me. I, uh, I got a, I got a house that I'm kind of putting together, trying to kind of just kind of make my own. And uh, the nice thing about it is I got a, I got a gym in here so I can, so I don't have to worry about all the, all the restrictions that California has right now on, on COVID stuff. It would just be kind of a pain to, to have to be bouncing around and whatnot. And, um, and then also in, for the, for the most part of my career, um, well, up until this year, I was always with the San Diego Padres. So I could just go work out down at Petco park in San Diego, right down the street from my house, pretty much. And, um, you know, obviously that was pretty convenient and now being with another organization, um, I, I'm not, pro I'm probably not going to fly to Cleveland every morning just to go work out. So, uh, <laughs> my plan is, so oh, what I've been doing, I got a, I got a little home gym and, um, it's, it's, it's given me an opportunity to kind of. Uh, be a little bit more of a homebody and take care of business around the house. Uh, you know, I got, um, like I said, trying to make this house my own, but, um, but yeah, kind of trying to make the adjustment in this, uh, in this crazy year we're living in. Yeah. Tell me about it. It's crazy. So are you just, are you into any baseball activities yet or is it still too early for that? Are you just in the gym? Are you, are you working on any of your catching? Are you, do you have a place to hit right now? Anything like that? Yeah. So, so that, that's, that's basically the main stuff I'm doing. I've, uh, okay. I've kind of realized at this point in my career, um, the strength side is obviously very important. You got to get big and strong, but, um, I've kind of, a you know, uh, established a nice foundation of strength, like a strength base for myself where, you know, going in and needing to, to lift three, four, 500 pounds of things just isn't, that's not what's going to make me a better baseball player. So a couple more, uh, fine tuning, uh, little, you know, the, the, the smaller muscles, the core muscles, um, I'm kind of focusing more on that and then spending a lot more time on the, on the skill set side. So doing a lot of hitting, a lot of catching, um, there's a batting cage down the street from my house that, um, you know, and, and if someone's there to do some work with me, um, obviously I got them, but if not, they got some pitching machines so I can, I can go fire those up and take some swings and do my catching work. Um, so right now, just, just trying to probably for the past month or so, just, just been kind of, um, getting that foundation again with the, with the skill set stuff. And then probably after, after the holidays start ramping it up quite a bit more. So, um, so I'm, so I'm ready for spring. Nice. Um, so the move to Cleveland last year happened kind of late, even in the shortened season, but I know you got to get there and, and kind of establish yourself, but you gotta be looking forward to working with that staff. I mean, you got the, the reigning AL Cy Young, uh, you got some really good young arms. McKenzie's electric from what I've seen and just a really good staff. Um, have you started building up a rapport with those guys or has COVID just made it tough? And like, I, from everything I'm hearing, spring training's kind of a go, um, maybe with some COVID restrictions in place. But uh, is that going to be the first time you get to work with those guys? Or how do you stay sharp? I know you're catching, but catching off a pitching machine has to be a little bit different than, than, than big league stuff. Right. So that, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, obviously it's an, it's an outstanding opportunity for me with that staff. That's the, 
I think at least from the starting rotation standpoint, they were first in like every category in major league baseball. So that's kind of what I did last year for the, for about the month or so I was there, I wasn't playing a whole lot. So it was, it was my goal to just establish those relationships, build, build a trust factor from just human to human. That's kind of my philosophy and how I try and earn some pitchers trust is be like, Hey, like I'm here for you. And, you know, I want, I want to see you do good because if you do good, the team's going to do, do good. We're going to win games. And then it's obviously a good reflection on myself. So it's win, 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 everybody wins. So um, I tried to do that. There, obviously there's a lot of uh, young arms there too. So for a guy that's 28 years old with a handful of years in the big leagues, like I, I kind of went into an organization where I had some of the most service time on the team. So I'm kind of one of the veteran guys on this team. And um, so it's kind of a new challenge for me. That's, that's, that's pretty fun to take on because I've got, you know, a handful of these guys I mean, they got one, one and a half years in the big leagues. And so I've just at least got some experience and I've played with some, some amazing pitchers who I can just give a, give a little bit of wisdom from things that I've learned to them and hopefully, um, you know, uh, speed up that learning curve because, because they're going to get punched in the face at some point, you know, I mean, they're, they're young guys and um, obviously there's some high expectations for them, but if they can uh, have a little bit of help from, from someone who's seen some things, that's kind of, that's, that's what I'm trying to get for from them. Um, but from, uh, from a, from a physical standpoint, I think, um, I'm, I'm going to, I'm driving out to, uh, to Arizona actually next week to go, uh, to the complex. Uh, there should be some guys there to get some more, some work. I don't know if guys are throwing bullpens yet, but like you said, that it's, it's definitely right. There's, there's only so much on a pitching machine you can do than, than actually getting behind some arms. So ideally next week. And then I think like, like I said, like moving into the new year is when I'll start catching some bullpens and making it. Um, about as about as ramped up as I can get. So, because um, like like my goal every spring training day one is is basically game ready. So the rest is just you know just fine tuning some little things. So um, yeah, we're on the right track right now. Cool. Yeah, um, we've had several uh, conversations in, in the past, and what's always impressed me about you is is the the intellect and the thought process you bring to your position. Um, you know, we've talked, we've had conversations about analytics and stuff, but I, I feel like you're a big asset to an organization. And we've talked in San Diego, they'd leave big binders in your locker and they had reports on everybody, but you pride yourself on doing your own film work, your own research. Um, you're going to a new league. You're going to, you know, even with interleague, you're going to see a lot more new hitters. Um, you're going to have the new staff. Even though you're 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 working physically, are you able to do a lot of film work and and um, just beyond the the physical? Are you are you able to pick up you know the the new pitchers you're going to be working with what what they do and kind of establish s some plans? So when you do build up that personal relationship and trust, is is that something you're still able to do even with the COVID and and um, you know, how important is it to, to learn the hitters now in the AL Central as opposed to where you were in the NL West? And uh, how, are you, how are you working on that? That's, that's basically what I was doing um, for about the whole month or so I was, I was there when I got traded because, like I said, I, was, I wasn't playing a whole lot. So I had a lot of time on my hands to, to just, to, like you said, le learn those hitters, learn my new pitchers. And so I spent a lot of time watching film um, along with talking to the guys. But um, so, so yeah, with talking to the, to the pitchers about their stuff, about, you know, their past histories against these hitters, specifically the AL central, because that's a, that's a division that I never, I've never really played. And they obviously have played a ton and I'm about to play, you know, half my season against those teams. So, um, a lot of communication, but, but yes, definitely a lot of film. Um, the film just for, for, for me, um, just kind of helps me get a sense of who, who that, who that hitter is. Um, but I don't, I, I guess I don't need to do quite as much during the off season because um, pe people make adjustments, you know, the, the hardest, the hardest month to scout for and prepare for is April. April's very, very hard because what did guys do? Guys were just for four five, six months, just making adjustments, just working on things, trying to get better. And they do guys get better. And, I always, I always laugh, like one of my favorite quotes, quotes from uh, one of my old uh, pitching coaches, Darren Balsley, when a, when, a, when a guy would throw a slider down and away and guy would hit a, a homer or something, the pitcher would be like, well, he's not supposed to hit that pitch. 
And he's like, I mean, it's big league hitters are allowed to make adjustments. You know what I mean? Like they're allowed to get better. And so that's, so I have to be prepared for that where there's a lot of information on, say I want to prepare for Nelson Cruz in Minnesota. There's a lot of that, a lot of that bats I could watch against Nelson Cruz, but for all I know, Nelson Cruz is, you know, into his forties. Maybe he's going to make some adjustment that he has to for an older body type coming into this year where he's a different hitter. Now he's doing something like, and I have to be prepared for that adjustment. So I guess some of the film that I'd be watching is who are these guys to their core? Like, because guys only change so much. So, so just kind of understand who they are. Um, this is at least the type of hitter they are. This is, do, do, do they make adjustments mid at bat or are they mid game adjustments or do they not really make adjustments? And then maybe anticipating that going into this year. Um, but then really the hard work will come, uh, come when the season starts and we got to be like, all right, you know, Shane Beavers throw an opening day. If I'm catching him, then, pretty much an opening day we're going with Shane Bieber's stuff his strengths and being like good luck hitting the best pitcher in baseball and then something's going to happen in the third inning then we're going to go talk and be like all right hey we got maybe less curveballs let's attack with some more fastballs they're kind of it looks like they're waiting for some soft stuff right now so and then obviously then we'll move forward throughout the season but uh, that's kind of the 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 plan step by step from at, at least kind of where I started in August, um, and then I guess my plan moving into April of next year. Wow, that's that's great insight. You, I mean, I would think that you know, and I guess it's guys working out all the time year round, but you know, I think a lot of traditionalists would think, well, April guys are still getting the, the rust out, but you're saying they're getting better. It's the hardest to scout for because maybe they've been working on some things. So to that point, are there any specific things that you are working on any parts of your game that you're really, I want to get better on this. I mean, we all know defensively what you bring and, and, and how great you are um, in all aspects of defense, whether it's framing pitches, blocking pitches, calling games. Um, I know you're always working um, on the other side of the ball on, on, on offense, but any, anything particularly you you're really focused on right now? Yeah. I, I, I guess when, uh, when I say guys are allowed to make adjustments, I'm, I'm, I'm almost like talking to myself. I'm like, Hey man, you're allowed to make adjustments. You're allowed to get better. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like when I show up, like I've got some numbers that aren't the sexiest of numbers where somebody would be like, Oh, this is how we're going to get him out. But ideally I come in and it's like, Oh, Whoa he got a lot better. We got to make an adjustment. So for me on that end, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm working, not that I'm not working hard at catching too, but I'm working really, really hard in offense right now, trying to, trying to be a complete player that, um, that I plan on being. And so obviously there's a lot of mechanical things, just getting a consistent swing going, um, challenging myself with some drills too. But one of the big things I'm doing, I'm doing a lot of eye training right now. And with this eye training, there's a, there's just kind of ways that you can, with 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 the muscles in your eyes i don't think quite enough people tap into you have the ability to slow the game down a little bit tap into some of these eye muscles that do have the ability to make a 100 mile an hour pitch look more like 85 and you know if just from there if i if i feel like the game's moving at an 85 mile an hour pace instead of 100 even with bad mechanics like things are going to work out a little bit better so that's one of the big things i'm doing with some and like i said earlier with the with the strength stuff um, I'm doing some more specific, like um, less like big bulky strength and some more functional movement things that will help me with my swing. Um, so there's a lot of, a lot of the, all the things I'm doing for my body and my mind and my eyes are all specific for baseball. I tell all the guys that are training me, I'm like, Hey, like, I don't want to, I don't need to be strong. I don't need to be good in the weight room. I don't need to be good at any of this. I need to be good at baseball. Okay. So all this stuff, if it's helping me be good at baseball, let's apply it to baseball because I can be bad at everything else, but if I'm really good at baseball, we're in good spot. So that's kind of, that's kind of where I'm at. And, um, and I'm, I'm really pumped about some of the adjustments I've been making. And obviously um, you never know until you, until you go do it, but, but definitely looking forward to spring training and getting some real at bats. Awesome. Well, great to hear. So you have your morning, you're, you're doing your workout, you're flexing those eye muscles, you're slowing the game down. Now you move on to your day and you start looking at your fantasy football team. You start looking at your fantasy football lineup. I know you've told me in the past, also when you're working out, you're, you're sometimes listening to fantasy football podcasts and, and, and beefing up. Um, 
what what has your fantasy football life been like since you've entered the league? I know you've been in a league with with the or, or, or done a fantasy league with the Padres. That's maybe still the league you're in based on when you were traded this year. But um, what is fantasy football to a baseball clubhouse and organization, and and how does it kind of bring the guys together? Fantasy football, most of us like to, we, it's second Christmas, man. It's, it's, you got, you got Christmas and you got your fantasy football draft. So the draft is like the, the greatest day ever, which made it so crazy for me this year. I got traded or basically found out I was going to get traded the next morning during our draft. So I no was going to be, I was commissioner like of the clock. league. Dude, I'm on the clock. I'm running like, I'm, I'm trying to make sure this whole event is set up, which is also very hard to do during a COVID year because we normally we get, you know, someone to come cater and it'll be like a big old event. This year it was just us and there's only so much I can do. And the Padres traded for two catchers in the middle of our draft. And so everyone's like looking at me just like, when are you out here? <laughs> and so like, I'm trying to run this as a commissioner. And meanwhile, knowing like, when am I like on like trade rumors, like what, what's happening end up happening the next day. Um, but it was just a whirlwind of emotions for like the, you know, the most exciting day to like, holy crap, like life's about to change quite a bit. Uh, so but, your war so, room was, was a, was a lot different. <laughs> it was crazy. I mean, cause there's, there's the normal trash talk that all the guys have. And like, it, I was, everyone else wasn't as aware of what was going on as I was because it obviously wasn't happened to them. So like, it was like, it was, it was hard for me to, to stay locked in and present and like, you know, give, have that good banter back and forth. Um, but it still ended up being great because, because the draft was super fun. Um, I, so that was the Padres league. So let me ask you a question. Since, since you mentioned you were the, the commissioner, were you the commissioner because you were coming off a championship the year before? No, sadly, no. I was just the one that cared, cared, and cared the most about it to make it great. <laughs> we've had some, uh, we've had some collusion going on. Actually, one of my teammates, the guy that was on my fantasy football team was involved in a little collusion. So I had to make sure, uh, make sure he, he did things the right way. And I think uh, I just had high expectations of, of what is a great league. The Padres run an outstanding fantasy football league and it's super competitive. I've, so I guess this was my, my sixth year in that league. And I've got, this is my sixth year and I went second, first, second, fourth and right now in how about this in our league this year five teams went nine and four wow so i'm nine and four i'm tied for first with four other teams and is this a 10 team league or a 12 team league 12 team league all teams went nine and four and honestly two or three of the best teams in the league didn't make the playoffs makes no sense how many teams in your format make the playoffs six two buys Two, so, top two get a buy, and then and you have and you have four teams at nine and four. Are you one of the buy squads? No. So I'm. I mean, it was like within a dozen points of first, second, third, fourth, fifth. I end up being nine and four and getting fifth. Oh wow! In the league, and so I'm playing the fourth place team. Uh, and I mean, but but I mean, like it, it was really incredible because there's not. I'm looking at some of the teams. I'm like. It's, they're not that scary teams where like there's a team that didn't make the playoffs that went like four and nine. They got like Dalvin cook, DK Metcalf, AJ Brown, Terry McLaurin, Lamar Jackson, like just incredible teams. And, and, and a bunch of us are in the playoffs. But there you go. Because my biggest regret of my fantasy league, I'm in a league that is so quarterback centric you play three quarterbacks and you really need them. And I took Lamar Jackson with my first pick and he's been my nightmare. And then all of a sudden on Wednesday night, he like shows who Lamar Jackson is a, a, a little bit, a little bit too late for, for my liking, but going back to your draft. So what, what is your, what is your strategy draft wise? And I know a lot of it depends on your format, but, uh, Kind of give me your strategy. Give me who is your best pick and, and who is your biggest disappointment? So for the Padres League, we had the ninth pick and I went Josh Jacobs 
at nine and I went Travis Kelsey at the wraparound, which I'm not a huge, I don't, I don't like drafting quarterbacks or tight ends early, but Kelsey, the reason I drafted Kelsey is because as I was looking up uh, some of the numbers, he was wide receiver either four or five last year, not tight end, not just tight end one. He was like, it'd be like drafting DeAndre Hopkins there where people would be like, oh, that's a normal pick. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to have the, I'm going to have an unfair advantage at one position every week. And so when I'm a little bit weak at wide receiver, I remember that my wide receiver one is, it's like throwing Travis Kelsey at wide receiver one and like Devonte Parker at tight, putting him at tight end. And you'd be like, if Devonte Parker could be slotted into tight end, he'd be a top two or three tight end every week, but he's a top 20 or 30 wide receiver every week. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that, that's a that was good, kind of my strategy for that's that. A good way to look and then, at it. Uh, and then I traded both of them. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know if I've ever done. I traded my first two round picks and my I traded Wait, prior to the one. prior to games. Did you trade them on draft night or did you no, trade no, no, them no. over the course of the season? Over the course of the se- over the course of the season, I've traded my first four picks. I traded. I also drafted Le'Veon Bell in the third. That was my worst pick of the year. Uh, believing incur. in any team run by Adam Gaze is a terrible idea. So <laughs> don't draft Jets. Just don't do it until maybe next year when he's fired. But drafted Lady draft on the guys Bell that are to... playing against the Jets. Get Derek Ex- Carr in the fourth <laughs> quarter of last weekend. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. They're just they're going to run a dumb blitz because they know they need to go. They can't win a game so they can get Trevor Lawrence. But. <laughs> So I traded Le'Veon Bell as well, and I traded Amari. Amari Cooper was one of my best picks, actually, in the fourth round. Uh, I thought that was pretty late to get Amari Cooper. And he ended up being great, but once Dak got hurt, I was like, and I watched Andy Dalton come in, I was like, I can't. For my own sanity, I can't watch this every week. I can't watch Andy Dalton play. I do take that into account sometimes. I'm like, do I want, like, which is why, like, I, you know, I love getting Chiefs. You know, if you get Chiefs in your team, you're gonna have a you're gonna have a great time watching fantasy football because they're gonna be prime time. They're they they're gonna always put up a big play. Uh, but I basically turned my team into Nick. I so I traded Travis Kelsey and Amari Cooper for Nick Chubb, Mark Andrews, and Brandon Ayuk. And Ayuk's been better than Cooper, and Chubb's been outstanding. And yeah, but I've got Chubb too. And I lost that week when he decides to break a 59 yarder and then go out at the so one yard hard. line. Like, come on, Chubb. I, I know you went to Georgia or whatever, but they do teach math in college. Like you were going to make it a two score game. Todd Gurley went to Georgia too, and he did the opposite. And then he got I, roasted on social media for not falling down. So George is a confusing education. Apparently they don't, they don't really know what they're doing. That cost me that week. And I know Charles Barkley said he was going to punch Nick Chubb in the face. <laughs> yeah. Charles so did Barkley you trade for him before down. that? Did you no, have was, him when he went out I at the one yard his, line? Was that his, that, that was his first or second. That week was back. his first game back from injury. I was so excited to get him back and I put him in and then he pulled that stuff. <laughs> He, yeah, he, I traded for him like the week before. That's how I could get it done where I had to like, I had to wait one more week for him to come back. And then, yeah, I, luckily the rest of my team, I think played pretty good. I, I've been, I've been falling in love with Brandon Ayuk. He's my, every single week I check my rankings on, I've got, I've got like my guys that I listen to. I listen to the, the fantasy footballers podcast. I would highly recommend it. It's hilarious. It's family friendly and they're all like top 10, uh, uh, most accurate uh, professional whatever pickers like every mm-hmm. year. So they do a good job. Um, and I'm, even on their rankings, when looking, Brandon Ayuk is a, they have him at like wide receiver 36, 40 every single week. And I can pull up my phone right now and show, dude puts up a ton of catches and touchdowns. Like early in the year, he wasn't getting any work, but he found a way to get in the end zone. And now he's getting all the work and he's doing both. And I'm really confused by it because I've I'm having to like make decisions on whether to play him or not. And no one seems to give him any love. But like if you check the numbers, man, this guy is this guy's a top 10 wide receiver every single week. Yeah. Well, and out here on the West, it's fun to watch him. I mean, Debo's back and Debo's 
just cranking out yards now, but Ayuk keeps finding the end zone. I mean, I think part of it's probably on – they do have Nick Mullen throwing to him, but they're still – I mean, they get the yards. I think Ayuk is poised to be like Medcalf if he can stay healthy. Like, he's, he's a beast. He, he's always open. He's just yeah. – there's a handful of guys where like when you watch – when you watch Devonte Adams play, it's like guard him, like someone guard him. Like obviously you can't because I would like to think that a defensive coordinator doesn't enjoy knowing about Deon or Devonte Adams and then watching him get twelve catches and three touchdowns. I'm like just just let Alan Lazard do that. Yeah. Like make make someone else do it and make I don't understand. Like it'd be like, like I'm not going to pitch to Barry Bonds anymore. I'm going to walk him. <laughs> so. I don't know. Yeah. I always get confused when guys like that just can always go off. So you're going into this weekend, four versus five matchup. What do you got? I mean, you I mean, at this point, is are there are there moves that you can make or are you just trust in what you've done and who are you going up against and what does their team look like? So my whole my whole squad is is streaming. I've got three quarterbacks, four running backs four wide receivers and two tight ends that are all options. So quarterback, I'm riding out Ryan Tannehill, who I've been streaming with uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick and Kirk Cousins. So all I've been doing pretty good, but I'm riding out Ryan Tannehill week one against Jacksonville. Then my, my running backs are Nick Chubb, Kenyon Drake, Raheem Mostert, and Wayne Gallman. All other than Nick Chubb's the auto start, but how about can I ask you this? Who and you got to play two of them because I'm not deep enough at receiver. You have to play two of Wayne Gallman, Raheem Mostert, and Kenyon Drake. Who do you got? Half PPR. Well, the Giants. Oh man, Giants are on a on a pretty good roll, and they have they have Arizona Cardinals this weekend. I mean, I. I, I like Mostert against Washington, um, but Washington's been playing better too, and they they get in those like 2017 type games. But you know Shanahan wants to to run the ball, and they're playing in Arizona. It's all weird. The Cleveland Baltimore game. The thing about that is, you know. Chubb always has the chance to just take one to the house. And it's like in one play, you've just gotten like one the week. I won the week. week. Yeah. yeah. So I, I but you said Chubb's your automatic. So man. Yeah, I can't watch him break off a 70 yard touchdown in the playoffs and have like and he doesn't dud. He I mean, since he's been back in my league, he's gone 19, 12, 25, 17. So like I feel like 12 is the floor. And that's yeah. okay. Where so for me, like Mostert, that's a good Washington team, but I don't think Washington's gonna score that much. So I think it's I think they're gonna run, I think he's gonna get 16 carries, which makes me happy. And then that's kind of how I play. I'm like, who's gonna get the most opportunities and what's the game script gonna be like? Because Wayne Gallman, I like, but what's the game script? Who what game script is better for who? Wayne Gallman against Arizona or Kenyon Drake against the Giants? Because they're playing each other. Right. And that's is Daniel the Jones decision. back this week. Is that decided yet? Because I, I think that he, has an impact too. If, I don't, I have not heard anything about Daniel Jones, but Cole McCoy looks very good last week. I don't know. Like, I'm, he, I'm he leaning running offense. I'm leaning towards. Mostert there. I just think the Niners are going to want to run the ball. And I have a special place in my heart for Mostert because I I won my 95-person fantasy playoff-only league last year when Mostert broke off four touchdowns for me in the NFC Championship game. And I was the only person that had Mostert. And that's one of those leagues where you're just, you can share players, but you just had to have one player from every single team. And then you had to fill out a roster like accordingly and then and no one else loop. chose him until i was the Oso's only guy in, i was the only guy everybody else took kittle they took either kittle or they took like the 49ers defense because yeah because the way it worked was you had to have okay so there's 12 teams in the playoffs you have t- 12 slots 
you have to have one person from each team and then you have to fill all your position slots. So like two quarterbacks. And then when a team gets eliminated, okay, you, you lose you... that player. So you also have to strategically pick like, oh, I'm fine losing my kicker in week one. Um, so I'm going to pick whoever I think is going to lose in week one. I'm going to fill that slot with the kicker. And anyway, so I got a soft spot in, in my heart for Mostert. But... So, so now you got to choose between Gallman and Drake. I need Gall- Gallman or Drake. Right now I have Gallman in. It's, basically, it's Arizona versus the Giants. Which running back, which team's running back will do better? And the thing that scares me about Drake is the offense just doesn't look good with whatever is going on with Kyler. And Gallman is just, I mean, the dude's just on a tear. Yeah. He's got one, two, three, four, five. He's got six touchdowns in the last five weeks. And, I mean, he's gone 13 and a half, 12, 13, 18, 16, 14. Just a, the, the crazy thing is he's just, he's good. Where Kenyon Drake has a higher ceiling. And I have to decide if I want ceiling or floor. Yeah. But the consistency is so important because Arizona will do it different, different weeks. I mean, one week it's Christian Kirk scoring an 80 yard touchdown or it's, you know, there's been a couple of weeks where, where, where Kyler and, and Hopkins have just been so in sync that kind of uncertainty going in is like, how are they going to get their points? What is their offense going to look like that day? Gallman has been really steady. I mean, you, they're getting him the ball. They're getting him touches. So it's, uh, that's a tough one though. And he would be the one to get in the end zone where Kyler loves to snipe touchdowns from Drake. (laughs) Right now I have Gallman in as a two point less projected score, according to ESPN. Which, you know, that projected score always, like, it makes you be like, oh, like, where it's like, you got to listen to them. Like, nope, I can't. I can't do it. And then I guess my other decision is I have the Panthers D against Denver, who's the 32nd worst off. He's, they're the worst offense yeah. in the league. And I have the Cardinals D against the Giants. And I think I'm going to go with the Panthers D. So that's a situation for me where I don't like to put too many eggs in one basket because I have a heart attack when I watch the game. So, you know, if you've got too much invested in that in that Giants Cardinals game, for me, I'm like, ah. Plus, the Broncos are are inevitably going to throw a couple of picks. I mean, yes, Drew Locke has admitted that he just likes making bad decisions. <laughs> He's like, yeah, you know, it's mostly I just I just I I I see guys and I panic and I throw it and I'm like, what? What? <laughs> if I'm no. Drew Locke on the Sunday night football game from last week, the 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 picture of him, the graphic that like he allowed NBC to show, I'm like, dude, I would protest that. I mean, he looked like, <laughs> he looked like a guy that just makes bad decisions, and they're like, he oh. looked <laughs> like really you're gonna let Chris guys, Collinsworth and Al like, Michael oh. show that picture of you? That's worth like two picks right there. <laughs> Luckily, I'm I'm playing against. Uh, a guy that is super hurt. He's got Joe Mixon on the IR, Antonio Gibson, basically IR. So he's going Melvin Gordon, DeAndre Swift, DeAndre Hopkins, Michael Pittman. He's got Waller and Marvin Jones. And uh, and Deshaun Watson, who is going against Chicago, obviously without Fuller. Right now, he's projected to beat me by four points. Really? Yeah. But his team isn't very good unless Waller goes 13 for 200 and a billion Well, and touchdowns. Waller has a really tough D this week with Indy. I mean. He does. He does. That's it. So I'm hoping, I'm hoping Derek Carr does one of those things like he did a couple weeks ago and forgets how to throw the football. Um, the Raiders are so up and down. I mean. They play with Kansas City both games, and then they suck against Atlanta. Doesn't make sense. And then, Who, and then what, the Jets just basically gave him a get out of free jail card last week. They did. And the Colts are still battling to win their division. I, 
I don't see Waller doing the same thing, although the dude is a freak. He's not guardable. He's the – Kelsey's still tight end one, but if I had to <laughs> – I don't know, man. If you put if you put uh, Darren Waller on the Chiefs right now, <laughs> he would do some freaky things. Oh, he would. And it's he funny with freaky the, things. the Chiefs, you brought it up earlier. It's like, they're the only team I don't worry about having too many guys on the team. They seem like to have, I, I, I mean, Mahomes is so good. He seems to have like three footballs to throw around. But so... How is how is the the strategy is one thing. How is the shit talking going um, in your league going into the playoffs? We can cuss or, on this podcast. I've been trying. Like I didn't. Uh, here and there. I mean, it's, no, let's not make it okay. a, a like a Dave Chappelle like uh, okay. stand up routine. But but when you but if you really need to emphasize something, I said trash talk. I don't, I've said trash talk in my life twice in my life. Like what's <laughs> so, <laughs> just trying to make sure here. Okay, so the the shit talking is extreme. We at least with the Padres one, there's a there's a group chat WhatsApp where it's pretty ruthless, honestly. Like when I traded Travis Kelsey and then I traded Josh Jacobs, like I mean, pe- my my teammate on my team's Will Myers, and he's just like, dude, you're like you're ruining our team. What are you doing? And then we're nine Wait, and you four. You didn't consult and- with him before making the trades. He's allowed to make two decisions. He starts at kicker and he starts at defense. That's all he's allowed to do. <laughs> and then he's just half the bank. He's the, he's the rich guy on the team that just pays for half the league and we have fun with it. But I only allow him to make so many decisions. But he's like, I, he always gives me shit because I'm like, I'm, I'm the one that listens to the podcast and we have a bad week or I make what looks like a dumb trade. He's like, man, you need to pick a new podcast to listen to. I don't know what you're doing. But, but it's... It's on point. I mean, the, the, the group chats are, are incredible. Like, and then I got my, my other league I'm in, I did a, I'm in a first year dynasty league with all my buddies in San Diego. Okay. And so that's a 10 team dynasty league. So we're all, we're all constantly doing that. We, my, uh, my team, actually, we started one and three and finished 10 and three. Oh, nice. And got the one seed, but I traded in week two, I traded Jonathan Taylor and someone else for Tyree kill. And it was remember like Jonathan Taylor went off and it was like dynasty. So it's like, he had like one or two weeks of like a hundred yards and a touchdown. And this guy was like, Ooh, that's a really good dynasty running back. And then he shit the bed and Tyree kill. I got Tyree kill and D and then I traded for DK Metcalf as well. And then I have Pat Mahomes. So I have Pat Mahomes, oh Tyree kill. And you DK don't win Metcalf. that league. <laughs> it's and Kittle got hurt, but otherwise I had Kittle. And then my running backs were like Miles Sanders, Antonio Gibson. Uh, I got J.K. Dobbins, but my, now I'm kind of I'm, I'm actually nervous at running back because luckily I got a first round buy, so hopefully Miles Sanders figures something out. But can you explain to me why Doug Peterson plays uh, Jordan Howard and Boston Scott the same amount of snaps? Well, I I gotta think. I don't know what's happened to Peterson. I mean, is he just still kind of on, I want a Super Bowl, and so I'm like in the clear for a little while? It's like the same team. Like, you got the same quarterback. You got a better running back than you had in, who was their running back? Like, Jay Ajayi? Yeah, they had Ajayi, who they got like late. Or maybe Jordan Howard, but Jordan Howard wasn't any good. Yeah. He's he's good for a nice three-yard fall down carry. Yeah, it's... so. I don't know what to the do. The NFL is like the least predictable like sports league there is, but I think that's why we we love the fantasy love so much. So so you got this thing with the Padres, you guys are you're going at it. And I mean, I, I gotta just imagine that that's just a great thing to keep you guys connected this time beyond just being baseball teammates, because you know, we all need so much more during COVID. So I mean and you being traded mid year, it's just a, probably a great way to keep up with those guys. And then, so what are your plans? Are are you already set to endear yourself to your new teammates in Cleveland by by raising your hand and saying, you know, I'm the commissioner here as well, or or what's that going to look like? Are you going to stick with the? How are you going to do this? I, I I think they should be good on commissioner, but I did I so they happened to have their draft the same day the Padres did, 
And so I was too late for the draft, but I did buy a team. So I went okay. in and I, I, I invested in an already drafted team and I almost, I almost, we almost pulled it off. We finished, it was a, not a good team that finished seven and six and was the seven seed. And, and, and it was heartbreaking. So you, say you, so you say you bought it. So, so somebody else had drafted it and you, they you, drafted, you, you yeah. helped stake them. I turned, I turned Austin Eckler into Tyreek Hill. Jesus. Which is huge. I turned uh, someone not that great for Antonio Gibson, which ended up knocking us out of the playoffs because he got hurt in the first quarter, but got us there. Um, it was a it was a really good team, but not very well drafted. Uh, but it was really fun because I got to at least be in the league, which um, because so, I'm I'm definitely gonna want to take over next year. So without throwing a new teammate under the bus, and you can name names if you want, but you don't have to. Who is better, your <laughs> Cleveland Indians partner or your Will Myers, who you've already <laughs> let us all know doesn't know fantasy football except maybe kickers? <laughs> Will knows nothing about fantasy football. <laughs> I have Will on there because he's one of my best friends in the world, and we have a good time doing it. And also, he's he basically agreed to be on my team because he would get so annoyed with me at the draft. Like he would get, he's the guy at the draft that's got headphones in talking to, you know, Adam Scheffner or something, someone, cause he's got some contact and he wants to do this perfect draft and he sticks. And so while I'm having some drinks, having fun with the boys at the draft, cause that's what you're supposed to do. He's over there taking it seriously. So every time I'd make a pick, I would go right up over to his table and just annoy the crap out of him. Just make sure that, <laughs> And he would legitimately get mad at me to the point where he's like, dude, get away from me, get away from me. And so I think I annoyed him enough where he was trying to take it so seriously where he just kind of bought in. Uh, but then he doesn't even watch football. So he, he like, he just likes to keep up with it on his phone. It's like, I've got, I'm on Sunday ticket on my iPad, on my iPhone and my TV. I got every game on in the house where he's not as bought in. So the Indians guys, I was I, it actually wasn't. I didn't buy in with any players. It was our uh, our uh, athletic trainers, um, okay. but they 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 were pretty locked in. Um, but it, it essentially um, was a really good opportunity for me to kind of get to know those guys. Because so now I'm in now I'm in the fantasy football team group chat. So I'm starting to learn guys. I like I don't know. I've never met any of these guys in my life, and it definitely sped up the process of developing relationships with them. Uh, by joining that league more so than just having like a, the team group chat is another one, but the fantasy football one is a little more intimate. Yeah. It's funny who's good at fantasy football and who's invested or not. I think I've told you this in the past, uh, the main league that I'm in, one of our guys actually played in the NFL um, for a couple of years. Um, I mean, he's my age, early, early 40s. So it was a while ago, but still some of his best friends now today are, you know, tied into the NFL at some point. And he is terrible. He's awful. And he's going to listen to this and he's going to get so mad. He's actually doing well this year, but he's coming dead last the last three years. But every year at the draft, we're like, oh, everybody gives him this like deferential treatment because he played in the league. And it's like, you know, so he was playing his buddies and stuff. Yeah. Touchdowns. And it's like, you know, but, it, but it's funny. So is there anything, um, in major league baseball, like that connects fantasy football. I mean, obviously you're, you're connected across a couple of teams now, but are there any other like platforms or, or any other things that guys do cross team or um, yeah, like promotion so or anything? I'm actually really involved in one of them. This was, this is the first year in three years that I didn't do it. Um, I, like it was just obviously a weird year, but uh, it's called big league impact. And Adam Wainwright helped start this company um, this nonprofit where they're in almost every big league city now where they come to you. So uh, Skip Schumacher was best friends with Adam Wainwright and they, the, in San Diego, didn't have a big league impact fantasy football uh, league. And so what they do is they, you help and you, you, you get people from the community and you get a 12 team league. Uh, I did it with a couple teammates. The first year, Will Myers and Eric Hosmer both did it with me. So it was, the three of us and nine other um, San Diegans. And it's a, I believe it's a, it's a $2,000 buy-in and 
50% of it goes to, or 25% of that goes to the same local San Diego communities. Another 25% goes to Big League Impact to the charities that they work with. They build a lot of homes and schools in the, in the Dominican Republic and Haiti and places like that. And then the other 50% goes to the player who's running uh, the league to his charity of choice. So luckily like, I'm very involved in that stuff. And um, my family and I are very involved in a, in a charity group called Wells of Life where we build wells in Uganda. Um, oh, wow. And so I got 50, so 50% of it goes to my charity. Um, so it's literally a 12 team league, 100% goes to. And when you say 12, team, around, 12 leagues, is it a, a different franchise takes over or a different major league city takes over one of the, the leagues, uh, the teams? Yeah, exactly. So like, like Aaron judge was the guy in New York where big league impact went to them. And they had a bunch of New York guys where 25% was going to local New York. And then whatever Aaron judge is involved in, he's getting 50% of that to go do that. And then they, they do super cool prizes where, so you're playing in your own league while the baseball players are also playing against each other in a crazy head to head where there's even more prizes. Um, they do an outstanding job. Like the, the draft we did, like the first year we did in the Western metal building, like upstairs, yeah. like just a, a sick thing where they're, they're literally just a bunch of Padre fans that, that come in that, Maybe they work in the bar restaurant industry. They're this and they want to meet some players and they're also given to a good cause. So that's probably my favorite league that I, I didn't get to be a part of this year, but they do just absolutely incredible stuff where uh, then they actually last year uh, helped me do where I was actually more in charge of doing some stuff uh, in the local community where that 25% that goes to the local community, we kind of made that more of a specific thing where in San Diego, we were doing a lot of, we wanted to do a lot of stuff with military. And so we brought in this military group and then they were there and they brought represent like representatives at the draft, you know, big old draft board announcer and people are there like for this amazing cause. So that's, that's maybe my favorite thing I do because it's like, I get to play the game that I love with some friends, some random people, but everyone doing it for, I guess, all the common good. And, uh, Big League Impact does an absolutely amazing job with that. Big League Impact. That's cool. I'm going to check that out. And and that one, I mean, it's for charity and it's for a good cause, but you're also playing against other other big leaguers. So is, I mean, there's just a way to like, again, connect players and get you guys, you know, um, talking. But is is because it's for charity and whatever, is there as much, you know, We'll, we'll go back to Absolutely. trash talking now Absolutely. that we're talking about charity. <laughs> I don't have everybody's phone numbers in the league necessarily, so I can't like be going out of my way to Aaron Judge and tell him how bad he's doing. <laughs> but <laughs> but at least like when the guys were in like my league, like like if if Will or Haas's team were were struggling, those are those are three main ones. They do uh, the 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 three of us are are in a pretty good banter constantly because Haas is really really good, really good at fantasy Indeed. football. He. He got second in the Padres League last year, and he got first. He got high score this year uh, and got first place for the regular season. So he's I, – I don't try to give him any credit, but he's, uh, he knows what he's doing when it comes to, when it comes to those sports bets. Um, are the trade – I mean, you've, you've, you've listed off so many trades. Like, I don't know. I've been in leagues where trades are, are, are really prevalent until they're not, meaning like – one guy continues to get the better end of trades and then the league is just like shut off from them. I've been in other leagues where it's just like, it's trade adverse from the beginning. Um, how do you get like, I don't know. I I'm, I'm not in a league that, that really does that. I mean, I think it's probably cool because it helps you engage with the other people in the league and it, and it, it fosters more um, shit talking and, and just, one of the things I love about fantasy football, it just keeps me connected with my buddies, which it, it can be hard to do sometimes when you got life going on. But is that natural in your guys' league to have that many trades? Or are you at the forefront? Are you the most like active GM? Or is this just like what you do? No, we, I, 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 think, I think the league has, has been, I think maybe we're lucky where, where guys are pretty open to, to making moves. Where, um, like for me, I'm, I'm quick to get rid of guys just – I. Uh, my my biggest strategy is the eye test. Like if I'm watching you play, like I traded Josh Jacobs this year. He was like he was like running back six on the year. 
But I'm like, I don't like the way you, I don't like it. You know, Devin Booker's getting too many carries. You're not catching enough passes. You're falling down before the end zone too many times. I'm like, I'm gonna get a I'm gonna get a two for one and I'm gonna I'm gonna go matchups between two guys because it's either play Josh Jacobs every week or I traded for Kenyon Drake. I traded Josh Jacobs for Kenyon Drake, Wayne Gallman, and Jarvis Landry. And now I just make, now I just played matchups instead of just be married to a guy who is obviously having a great year. But but if you have that bad week, I don't want it to be on your terms. I want it to be on my terms. So I'd rather have the discussion like with you or like, all right, Gallman or Drake instead of Jacobs or nobody, a waiver wire. So, well, and I think, I think the running back position in particular has become that like you have very few workhorses that you just, that you can just put them in and then sleep well that night and think they're going to do good. I think you can do that with some receivers and some, and well, obviously you got to do that with the quarterback. But um, the amount of, of running backs and then which defense is going to step up and which team's going to play with passion that week. Because I think a lot of it in the NFL, I, when I, my eye test is, are the guys putting in an effort that week? Because anybody can beat anybody except if you're the Jets and you have a bunch of idiots coaching you. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think, I don't like think this the, podcast is popular enough for Adam Gates. A team without a name care, the but, undefeated Steelers. <laughs> yeah, but... Exactly. And so I think a lot of it is like, Hey, what motivation went in? And, and, and I think games are so much turned on, on the defensive effort. You really have to play your matchup with your running back because if that defense shows up to play that week, dude, it's, it could be the difference of like 20 points. It's like Seattle, Seattle and the giants, like no one's predicting the giants to shut down. They came out with something. They, they wanted it more. And, in football, you can definitely, I totally agree with you because in baseball, if you want it more, it's still not going to help you go hit Garrett Cole. You know what I mean? <laughs> but in, I think in football, when it's just hand on hand combat, almost some guys just want it more. Yeah. And it, it's, it's whatever happened in the meeting rooms or whatever that week. Um, another question of maybe how fantasy football um, like connects major league players. Has it ever come up like, I know it's it's weird time of the year because usually it's the pennant race and stuff. But like once the drafts happen and say you're you're catching and and somebody comes into the box or you get a base hit and you get to first base, is, is there any ever fantasy football talk? Absolutely. The, I would I would love I would love to hear you say you're behind the plate and and somebody comes up and you know they're just a t- terrible fantasy football player and you get them thinking about that rather than Shane Bieber's <laughs> curveball or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no doubt i mean there's there there's the occasion like i was saying about that big league impact there's a handful of guys that that you know i'll recognize uh, that are in that league so you can you can talk about that here or there um but i mean yeah once once september hits in the draft you can you, you definitely know that the majority of the league is uh you know is 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 definitely looking forward to sundays you got your day game you know get get that day game go out and get a win and then get back out, get, get out of there and go watch Sunday night football. Everyone's always looking forward to that. Dude, that is so awesome. Well, Austin, uh, we could talk about this all day. I'm going to let you get back to it. Um, study your matchups. Um, good luck going into the playoffs. I, I hope you bring it, bring it home and, and get that, that championship. Thanks for coming on today. Thanks for talking a little bit of baseball. I, maybe we gave some people some, some tips and, and how to, how to work it this weekend, study those matchups. Um, and Hey, good luck with your work this off season. Um, get better every day, make those adjustments and, uh, yeah, man, we'll look forward to it. Keep, keep us posted on, on how you do this weekend. Hope you, hope you come out with the big W. All right. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Thanks again, everybody. That was a great show with uh, Austin Hedges today. A lot of fun talking about fantasy and football and how that connects to the big leagues. Um, and just, you know, we're keeping the topics diverse here on Right Off the Bat, which is an Easton original production. Shows produced by Connor McGlynn. Um, again, big thanks to Hedgy. Um, not only a Team Easton guy and an Easton ambassador, but just a good all-around dude doing stuff for charity, playing fantasy football. 
So that was a lot of fun and we look forward to having you again next time. Oh, I forgot. Make sure you download us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts for your listening enjoyment. Uh, and we'll be back with some really, really exciting guests over the next couple of weeks. Thanks, everybody. Bye.